must come here and listen to the words. They also have to feel. And they must be able to internalize. And in order to do that, you must combine the visual, the tactile, and the intellectual. Art reflects life, and there's so many things that kids need nowadays, and one of the most important things is to learn about prejudice reduction. Ever since I was a little girl, I would come visit the Holocaust Resource Center and look around at all these pieces. Just was so moved by them and wanted to contribute something as great as the pieces I saw here. My father screamed, run, run, run away. I was hit on the head and I fell unconscious into the snow. When the student is actually documenting the life of a person, they feel in a way like a visual journalist, you know, it gives them a real purpose. We're all essentially given the exact same assignment, but we all came up with something different, which is the beauty of being an artist. At one point, we had a theme in honor and memory of Janusz Korczak, who was this doctor, teacher, who loved children. In fact, gave his life for children. My parents were Holocaust survivors, and in 1988, it was going to be their 50th anniversary. My friend Nita and I were trying to figure out what to get them. One thing my parents didn't need is another silver platter. And Nita said, I know what, we're going to build something to commemorate the people who survived and the people who died and give that as a gift to them. We decided that we we're going to do it with the temple. The rabbi was very excited about it. And when he spoke, it touched everyone's heart. the entrance of the Holocaust Resource Center, there's a plaque on the right, and it says, from out of ashes, faith, vision, rebirth. Teaching the Holocaust can be something that we can give to our children as a way of understanding to be tolerant, to be loving and caring. They take the history that they've learned and they make it their own. They've committed it to memory. It's now theirs, and they can then share that. In ancient times, the Jewish people lived in the land now known as Israel. Christianity emerged from Judaism. Jesus was a Jew who was put to death by the Roman authorities. Some gospel accounts blame the Jews. The Jews were forced into exile. By the fifth century, Christianity was the dominant religion of Europe. The Jews were a small minority. The Christians persecuted the Jews and blamed them for all their misfortunes. In the Middle Ages, it was said that the Jews caused the Black Plague by poisoning the wells of Europe, that the Jews used the blood of Christian children in ritual sacrifices. Lies that came to be regarded as truth For centuries, laws restricted Jews, forced them into segregated districts called ghettos, prevented them from owning land, holding public office, and even becoming citizens. The 18th century was a century of promise, particularly for the Jewish people. The French Revolution marked the decline of the church and the rise of democracy. During this Age of Enlightenment, some called for the full rights for Jews, and slowly, by the end of the 19th century, 
Jews became citizens in every country of Europe, except in Romania. For the first time, Jews could get a higher education, enter professions and businesses, and integrate into the greater society. But even though many Jews assimilated socially and culturally and began to exercise their political rights, prejudice did not disappear. In 1889, a French politician posted the following. There are 30,000 who benefit from the 30 million Frenchmen who have become slaves. It's not a question of religion. The Jew is a different race. The Jew is our enemy. 1892, the Dreyfus Affair. Captain Dreyfus was an assimilated Jew the only Jewish member of the French general staff. He was blamed for selling secrets to Germany. He was stripped of his rank and sent to Devil's Island for life. Later, he was totally exonerated, but frenzied mobs in the streets of Paris chanted, Death to the Jews. In 1903, a new lie was created in Russia. In order to divert attention, from the oppressive living conditions, a Russian secret police forged a document, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This text claims to document the minutes of a meeting of Jewish elders who discussed their goal of taking over the world by controlling the press and the world's economies. A proven forgery, the Protocols was nevertheless translated into every major language and distributed worldwide. It is still available today. World War I comes along and the Jews are part of the German, Austro-Hungarian and French armies. Germany loses the war. Along comes the Nazi party with the idea that they didn't lose the war. They were betrayed. By whom? By the Jews, of course. Well, after the end of World War I, Hitler does talk about Jews as a problem. He blames them, but he focuses initially on winning the German people over with their loyalty. He's going to make Germany a great place. He rants and he raves and, and people just, they're weeping, they're crying. But the Treaty of Versailles punishes Germany and Germany goes into a terrible depression. Adolf Hitler walks right in and is able to rally the people to his cause and becomes chancellor. Once he's chancellor of Germany, he begins putting into place anti-Jewish legislation. And nobody could have predicted what was going to be. The first thing he does is he has a boycott of Jewish businesses. He's sending a very clear message to the German people that Jews are the root of their problem. And why would you, as a good German, support the Jews who stabbed you in the back? And then the next set of laws are the Nuremberg Laws. And those laws are race laws as well as economic laws. And they deny Jew citizenship. They determine who was Jewish by lineage. And it really is the establishment of race theory. Every few months, more and more laws will be passed. Uh, Jews cannot go to school. They cannot share the same park bench. They can't go to the theater. In 1936, we have the Berlin Olympics, and that was such a show for the world of the might of the Nazi party. And then after 36, there was a law saying that every town had to have a sign erected, and the main gist of the sign was that Jews are not welcome. The Jews have to get out. Jews were trying to leave Germany, but they couldn't go anywhere else because nobody would let them in. So there was a conference, and many countries were represented around the world. And only one country said that they would take Jews in, and that was the Dominican Republic. Some Jews did get out, but Hitler made it very difficult for people to leave Germany. He wouldn't let Jews take any of their money or belongings with them. After 1938, Jews could not leave. The borders were closed. Kristallnacht happens on November 9th, 10th, 1938. Synagogues are burned, Jewish stores are looted, the storefront windows are broken. This is the first real physical attack on people, where Jews are beaten up in the streets, where rabbis are assaulted, their beards cut. And it made the front page of every paper around the world, but nothing really was done to stop Hitler. The war breaks out in, in 1939 with the invasion of Poland. 
and three things basically happen very quickly. Jews must register with the police. Jews are forced to move into ghettos and an immediate Aryanization of property. If, if any Jews still have property, they're gonna lose it at this point. And then you're going to have an identification that all Jews must have a yellow star on their clothing. In the summer of 1941, Hitler invades the Soviet Union. He sends a mobile killing force to follow the German army, the Einsatzgruppen, which means special forces in German. And their job was to round up Jews and shoot them. And in some places, it's a couple of hundred. When you talk about some place like Babi Yar, which is in the Ukraine, 33,000 Jews are shot in three days. And more than a million Jews will be exterminated in this fashion. But it wasn't fast enough. You had to come up with a way to do this more quickly. The Wanzi Conference was really the next step. His top SS men, over a 90-minute lunch, discuss how are we going to murder all of the Jews of Europe. So as the Einsatzgruppen is doing the shooting, we also have the beginning of the building of the death camps. We played, we laughed, we were loved. We were ripped from the arms of our parents and thrown into the fire. We were nothing more than children. We had a future. We were going to be lawyers, rabbis, wives, teachers, mothers. We had dreams, then we had no hope. We were taken away in the dead of night, like cattle and cars. No air to breathe, smothering, crying, starving, dying. Separated from the world to be no more. From the ashes, hear our plea. This atrocity to mankind cannot happen again. Remember us, for we were the children whose dreams and lives were stolen away. makes it possible for a human being to murder a child. It's hardly believable that the human beings would do this. These same human beings who were law-abiding citizens, but unfortunately it is possible to take a society which has a moral compass and convert it to murderers. It's propaganda. First small steps. I don't like you. I don't want you to be in my classroom. I don't want you to live in my neighborhood or in my country. And eventually, I don't want you to live at all. That transformation took not centuries. The whole period of the Nazi existence was all of 12 years, from 1933 to 1945. We normally speak of six million Jews, one and a half million children. It's a number, but that's not a number. These are one and a half million children, individual human beings who had parents, siblings. People look at these photographs. What does the face say to you? You see a child with a pair of heavy glasses. Is this here a budding scientist or is he a bookworm? You see one that is looking healthy and boisterous almost. Is he a potential soccer player? Is it not possible that one of these children could have been the one who came up with cure for cancer? Is that possible? Some of the photographs, particularly of three children, it's a most horrifying story. 20 children were used in the camp of Neugam near Hamburg for experiments. But it was towards the end of the war. And so the British were coming within a matter of days. But now you have children who've been injected with various types of bacillus. And so the doctor decides that the only reasonable thing to do is to get rid of him. And so they transfer him from the camp into a school in Hamburg, take the children to the basement and hang them. Most evil, 
event that I can think of. You're talking about four weeks before the end of World War II. Continue to murder. Uh, one of the photographs is of my brother. My brother was a very spiritual person. He was a very gentle soul. I was with him in Auschwitz. I was with him on the death march. I was with him in Buchenwald. One day we were standing in formation to be counted and he and another hundred people are taken away. I never saw him again. But he lives with me. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think of him. So in a way I feel responsible that he's telling me, go out and tell the world what evil is. Tell the world it mustn't happen again. Not just to the Jewish people, to no one. When you see oppression, when you see poverty, when you see injustice in any form or any shape, it's in your school or halfway around the world. Don't stand by and do nothing. We can always do something to help other human beings. My name is Janet Lust Gaines. I am a child of survivors. I'm also an artist and an art teacher. When I heard about the opportunity for students to come here, meet with Irving, and be introduced to survivors, I was very intrigued by the learning possibilities. Several years after my involvement with students, Irving invited artists to pair up with survivors. Just by chance, I met Ethel. I had spoken to Irving about showing my work here on my mother's story, a series called Daring to be Defiant. The day I was bringing the work here, I heard Ethel speaking to a group of youngsters, and it really made a strong impression on me. The name of the piece is Driven by Raw Fear, I Ran. And that was a quote that Ethel gave to me when she was describing her story. And I thought, it's very eloquently put, and that really captures what she was experiencing. My name is Ethel Bauer Katz. I was born July 3, 1922. I had a family of seven. My parents, Anchel and Frieda Bauer, my sister Bronya, my twin brother Monio, and another set of twins, Romek and Molush. We had a very happy childhood. We lived on the river. We went boating, went swimming. We played soccer. I was the goalie and a good one. A few years before the war, we heard Hitler barking, but we did not believe it. It will pass. Nobody had the thought even to leave. That was the tragedy. Hitler marched in, and the atrocities began immediately. The first victim was the big synagogue. They pulled out all the holy books and threw it in the river and killed a hundred Jews. We had nowhere to go. The fall is coming. It's cold, it's raining, it's drizzling. We found our way back to our farmhouse. By that time, the German forces were crumbling already, and we hoped to survive. We heard planes, one plane, another plane, five planes, for several days. My brothers got very excited. They were singing, tomorrow, tomorrow we'll be free. 
in the middle of the night. Suddenly the owls on the roof were screaming and screeching. What's happening? What's going on? The house was surrounded. We ran to the kitchen to hide, but this was too late. We ran to the back windows and my father said, jump out. Run, run, run away. I was hit on the head and I fell unconscious into the snow. The first scene is really not a pretty picture. I have this looming character looking down on her and basically she was left for dead. When I woke up, I glanced and I saw black boots standing over me. I closed my eyes and I played dead. I said my prayers, this is the end. After a while, I look again, the black boots disappeared. Why? Because he ran to catch my running brothers. They went to the house, took out my father, my sister, my brothers, took them to the field and murdered them. I got up. Um, I was barefoot. I was in a cut little dress. Where should I go? Where should I run? I look around. Where? God, where should I go? I was really taken by her description of how she just had this will to run. And I was trying to really capture her sense of being alone. And she really ran for her life following this brutal murder of her family. Then suddenly in the distance I see three figures. My God, my God, the murderers found me. They followed me after my footsteps in the snow. No choice, I just collapsed in the snow and urged God for a miracle. And then in the final panel, when she collapses and awoke to these mystery figures who were coming towards her. And she didn't know at that point if they were her killers or her saviors. They come closer and I see that is crunching towards me. I just was with my head at my knees. I didn't see them even. They came over, they pulled me out and they recognized me. They were Polish youngsters. They remembered me, remembered my brothers and my father. They were my rescuers. By showing these three scenes and using art to tell Ethel's story, I think it has a unique impact, whether it be a young person, a student, an adult. They're going to look at these works and have to draw certain conclusions. And they are forced, really, to use their imagination. So I think it involves the viewer to the point where I'm hoping that they are curious to know more. Janusz Korczak's total devotion was to children and rights of children. At the time when you're talking the turn of the 20th century, uh, children were to be seen and not heard. His position was that children have opinions. The child has a voice. The child can express himself and the adult needs to listen. It's a totally radical idea, but it came out of his understanding of children because he himself was a pediatrician. So he goes and sees children. He charged the rich people a lot for their visit and nothing for poor. And he gave them medication and they physically got better. But emotionally, 
and the way they lived and the way they were treated, uh, they remained the same place. And he felt that that's unfair because they're human beings. They're not just creatures waiting to grow up to be adults. Janusz Kocz was born in 1879 to a Jewish family in Warsaw. His name is Hendrik Goldschmidt. But when you think of a Jewish family in Warsaw, you think of a long black coat and a fur hat. Not so. He was a very assimilated Jew. His whole family was assimilated. His grandfather was a physician. His father, an attorney. But his father died very early, and he was very bright, obviously, so he begins to tutor children and slowly begins to write while he simultaneously is going through medical school. And he decided that Henry Goldschmidt would not go over very big in Poland in the early 20th century. So he changed his name and whenever he wrote, of course, it was always Janusz Korczak. He writes both children's stories and he writes also pedagogic material, how to bring up children, how to treat with children is very, very critical of the idea that parents do not give sufficient emotional relationship to children. He has written a number of children's books. The most famous one is King Matt the First. King Matt the First is a child. He has everything. He has playgrounds, all kinds of very interesting foods, chocolate, but he's curious and wants to meet other children. And so he strikes up a relationship with a child and together they go out. And he sees that there are no playgrounds. And so he says, wait a minute, I'm the king. I should be able to do something about it. Every child should have a playground. And so he proceeds to start putting up playgrounds. And slowly, step by step, he convinces the adults that children are people. And it's really Korshak himself, how he sees the world. In some ways, he remains a child because he believes in the good and create a good society, particularly for children. And out of this came the idea that he would like to take children that were abused, neglected, orphans, and put them into an environment where they can flourish. And of course, he accomplishes that with a orphanage in Warsaw for Jewish children, and immediately launches upon the fact that children have to be respected. So here you have children who are three and five and 12 year olds are now being taken care of by adults. So how do you make sure that the children have rights? So what he's done is established a court system. The children voted to get judges, truly their peers, other children being 10 or 12 years old, who then look at each issue that the child has with respect to another child or with any of the caretakers, or even Janusz Korczak himself. And they would determine what's fair. And that concept of fairness permeates his whole personality. He was also on the radio. Most of Poland listened to it. But they knew that Janusz Korczak was really Henry Goldsmith and a Jew. And the problem became, how can a Jew possibly give advice to Polish parents so they gave him a name, the old doctor. So the old doctor would be there on radio every single week talking about how to bring up children. Poland was essentially a democracy. Jews were citizens. But in 1935, all this changed. The president of Poland died and the persecution of the Jews began. So as 1935 goes to 36 and 37, more and more prejudice takes place. And in fact, Janusz Korczak is no longer on the radio. Of course, 1939 comes along and Germany occupies Poland. Eventually the Jews go into the Warsaw Ghetto. His children must go into the ghetto. He has an opportunity not to go. Why? Because he's been given awards for literature and so on. So he's well known, and he has many, many Christian friends that say, don't go. 
we'll hide you, we'll smuggle you out, we'll get you to America. And he looks at them in bewilderment. He says, you are telling me to abandon my children? Would the father abandon his children? How could I? And so he goes into the ghetto with the children. He continues the educational system. He continues to publish a newspaper. It has thousands of children who write in this newspaper. He reestablishes in the ghetto the court system. Basically, he has established the Children's Republic. 1942 comes along, and the deportation of the Jews from Warsaw begins to Treblinka. One day, they find out that the children will be next. And so one of his very good friends outside of the ghetto, a Christian man, manages to get into the ghetto. But he has papers for two of them, himself and one paper as a sewer and water inspector in the ghetto by the name of Janusz Korczak to bring him out. It's the night before the deportation of the children and says to him, Dr. Korczak, ready to go out of here. He berates him. He says, how could you possibly ask me to do that? I should abandon my children. My, my children are taken from the ghetto into a cattle car. It's going to be dark in there. They're going to be scared. Who's going to comfort them? I must go with them. They get up in the morning. They get dressed in the best clothing. They're taking along their toys and books and march through the ghetto, singing with a flag of the kingdom, King Mac the First. An eyewitness, Yehoshua Pearl, wrote, a miracle occurred. 200 children did not cry out. Like stricken swallows, they clung to their teacher and mentor, to their father and brother, Janusz Korczak, that he might protect and preserve them. He carries one child, another by hand, into the cattle car. The cattle car is closed to Treblinka, and they're murdered. But what's interesting about Treblinka today, there's nothing there except 17,000 stones. Each stone is inscribed with a city, town, village, and country that the Jews came to Treblinka and were murdered. There's not a single name except for Janusz Korczak, who gave his life so that the children would not be frightened. The Janusz Korczak sculpture came about through my desire to somehow honor the man who I admired greatly. Yet in the United States, very few people know about him. And the idea or the march from the orphanage in the ghetto to the train was a very um, emotional kind of thing for me. And I tried to imagine in some way how would one show this? That the children were not screaming and crying. They were not just a ragtag, broken down group of children. And at the same time show Janusz Korczak. He's the ultimate defender of the child. Khaled Abdel Wahab, Joseph André, Gertrude Babelinska, Pierre Marie Benoit. All of Europe, in the midst of this horror, murder, the most evil thing man has conceived, there were people who actually were inside this society who, by and large, stood by and did nothing. And there were some who said, wait a minute, this is evil. I must do something about it. I must do something. Not somebody ought to do something. Elizabeth Boll, Franja Dedek. Because after all, my neighbor 
with whom I lived side by side for years, with whom I had drinks, with whom we had a barbecue, suddenly is a non-person, is a pariah? Can't be. My morality, I must do something. Because if I lose that, I lose my morality and I lose my humanity. Jean de Fault, Marc Donadil, Varian Fry. Rescuers, so many. They cross barriers. Some of them were old, some of them were new, some of them were male, some of them were females, very rich, very poor. Some of them were doctors and others were just plain farmers. It was as if I just dove into a bazillion subjects. It was very difficult. Patricia had a difficult time with it because she looked at one, another one, and she says she didn't know quite what to choose. I say, do you have to make a choice? Why don't you pick a number of them? As I did some research, I realized that maybe I should select somebody who saved a lot of people. Wallenberg, 30,000 people, that's good. But then you have Gertrude Babylinska who saves one person. What makes one better than the other. I realized that the greatest revenge was to save the Jewish community. So I selected people who directly or indirectly saved children because that choice gave the Jewish people a better chance of survival. So she chose 50 people each one of them, in his own right, is an absolute hero. When you look at the painting, they wear robes to show their holiness, and they carry an implement of their work. And they carry on their shoulders the child they saved. That child holds up the Star of David. The beauty of the Star of David is that this was the emblem that they put on them. It was the emblem of shame. But now that emblem was an emblem of victory. And uh, that star just keeps shining. Esta Hyber, Angel Sandris, Emil Taquet, Art, transcends age. Whether it's a child looking at the painting or whether it's an adult looking at the painting, it touches a part of their heart that makes them really feel. Then there becomes a connection with the past, and that's important. Antone Kalina, Joseph Kirschheimer, they did not go and claim over the roof, hey, I am a rescuer, quite the opposite. They were silent. They had to be silent, because if they were not, they would be killed, their families would be killed. And there are 23,000 trees planted in Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, specifically honoring those people who said, no, this is wrong, and I will do something. They stand out. They are the people who are our role models today. This is what we have to emulate. Heralda Luxen, Yevgenia Morozova, Ellen Nielsen, Dimitar Peshev, Merjam Pinkhoff, Katy Poirier Pousse.